invite you again to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 32. <clears throat> if, if someone this week were to ask you, can you tell me the history behind Thanksgiving, what we're celebrating here? How much would you be able to tell them? What, um, what would you be able to, to teach them in that regard? We'll come back to that, but in Deuteronomy chapter 32, we find <clears throat> that God is speaking to the children of Israel and he tells them in verse 7, remember, remember the days of old and consider the years of many generations. Ask your fathers and they will show you and your elders and they will tell you how God has been at work, how God has been leading us and teaching us. And if you just quickly turn to Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 15. Again, over and over in the book of Deuteronomy, he's telling them to remember, and I just want to point this out. Verse 15, And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and stretched out arm, Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath. Turn to chapter 7 and verse 18. He's bringing them to nations, verse 17, that are greater than, than you. And he says, but you shall not be afraid of them, but you shall remember well what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. So again he says... Remember what God has done. Chapter 8 and verse 2. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments. So again, he's saying, you'll remember I led you those 40 years. Look at chapter 8 and verse 18. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for he it is who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. Chapter 9 and verse 7. Remember, do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness from the day that you departed from the land of Egypt until you came to this place you have, been a rebel, you have been rebellious against God. So he says, remember how I've led you. Remember how I've blessed you. Remember how you have been rebellious against me. Look at chapter 15 and verse 15. Chapter 15 and verse 15. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this thing today. Again, remember chapter 16 and verse 3. You shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread with it. That is the bread of affliction. For you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, and you do this feast that you may remember the day in which you came out of the land of Egypt all the days of your life. So he reminds them again in verse 12. And you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt. In chapter 24 and verse 18. If you'd look there, chapter 24 and verse 18, but you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this thing. And just a couple verses down, verse 22, 
And you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, therefore I command you to do this thing. So, throughout the book of Deuteronomy, he is saying, remember, remember, remember how I blessed you, how I led you, how you were rebellious against me, how I brought this judgment, how I delivered you from Egypt. Remember, remember, remember. Why is this so important? Because any people that forgets the working of God soon turn from God. So we ask today, what do you know about Thanksgiving Day? Well, from, from the beginning, going clear back, so today part of my goal is to help us know our history. If, if you want to know how our nation got in the mess it's in today, in part, it's because we do not know our history. And those who do not know history are bound to repeat it. But back in England, Henry VIII, although he was carnal and selfish and wicked, one thing he did was he placed the Bible in the hands of the people. And as a result, there came new spiritual life in England. Now, he was followed by Bloody Mary and Queen Elizabeth, and both of these, from one side of belief to another side of a belief, both of them persecuted and killed believers, Christians. At that time, there were Puritans who desired to change the Church of England from within, thinking we'll stay in this and, and we'll bring change within. There was also another group known as the Separatists. They left the church and believed that they could interpret Scripture apart from the state church, which was a major thing because up until this time, People were dependent on the state church, the church to interpret the scripture to them. King James came in to rule, and the Puritans appealed that certain things in the church needed to change. King James responded unfavorably and stiffened the laws regarding religious meetings, that if you weren't a part of the Church of England, you couldn't meet. Many, of, many people could not go along with that. Some great names that stand out, William Brewster was 40 years old. He left the Church of England and started the separatist movement in his home. It grew so rapidly that it could no longer meet in his home. He had to meet in the stable. He began a group that was pastored by Robert and Richard Clifton. And I don't want to lose you in the details, but these are important things that we need to know. John Robinson also left the church as a scholar and a preacher. He became Clifton's assistant and was, provided strong leadership in the separatist movement. William Bradford, he was an orphan. He grew up raised by his uncles and grandfather to be a farmer, but because the Bible was made available to the public, during a long childhood illness, he began reading the Bible. He was exposed to the preaching of the separatists, and he came under the teaching of William Brewster and became a leading figure in the separatist movement. But the separatists were persecuted with great zeal to worship apart from the Church of England was a great crime and also to leave the country was a great crime. And they knew that they needed to obey God rather than man, Ephesians 5.29. So they planned to flee to Holland without going into detail they, they attempted it. They were arrested. Um, finally, after several months, they made it to Holland after many trials, many imprisonments. 
And they made it to Holland, and they believed that would be the place where they would be able to freely worship God. After 12 years in Holland, facing severe poverty and really fearing that they would lose their children to the corruption that was in Holland and the worldliness of the Dutch society, they planned their own colony in the New World. They boarded the Mayflower. Now, of the 102 on the Mayflower, not everyone were separatists. Not everyone was a believer. About half of them were strangers to the cause of Christ and were purely going to the new world for fortune. That provided adverse circumstances for the believers aboard the Mayflower. After two miserable months, think of that, two miserable months floating across the sea. Floating would be a misnomer to say. Um, they landed at Cape Cod, which was much to the north of where they had planned. On, on the Mayflower, there was much murmuring, much dissension. Um, it came very close to a mutiny. Forty-one men gathered in the captain's quarters in the midst of this, and they drew up the Mayflower Compact. Now, most everyone here has heard of the Mayflower, heard of the Mayflower Compact, but I think sometimes we fail to realize when we hear years ago the president of our nation say, we are not a Christian nation, we don't realize what the Mayflower Compact contained. Let me read just a portion. In the name of God, amen. This is in the midst of the, the contention and mutiny on the Mayflower 41 men gathered in the captain's quarters and drew this up. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign, Lord King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King, defender of the faith, and having undertaken for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. We do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another covenant and combine ourselves together into a civic body politic for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid. And by virtue hereof do enact constitute and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, constitutions, and officers from time to time as shall be thought most meet and convenient if the general good and of the colony unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. In witness, we ascribe our names at Cape Cod on the 11th of November in the reign of our sovereign Lord King James of England, France, and Ireland, the 18th, and of the Scotland, the 54th, we do this in 1620. You notice their purpose, have undertaken for the glory of God and for the advancement of what? the Christian faith. That is the first document of pre our nation. That, is the, that set the foundation of, of our nation. So, they signed that, and um, then they landed, and there was no one there to greet them. They had experienced scurvy and many adversities on the trip. And they came and were faced with 
the rigors of a northeastern winter. Only 51 of 102 passengers survived the deadly winter. Now, now just imagine in, I don't know what they mean, the deadly winter, but let's just say December, January, and February. Let's just imagine if in December, January, and February, everybody on this side died right here in our church. Do you know the impact that that would have? I mean, we suffer loss when one of our church family dies, but one half of them died. I mean, to persevere is, is incredible. And early in March, two Indians entered their camp. Samoset and Squanto. I don't have time to go into it, but they were miraculously prepared by God for ministry to raising up this godly generation that we now know. The pilgrims would not have survived. Squanto spoke English through uh, many experiences that he had being taken as a slave to England, brought back to America, taken as a slave to Spain, brought back. He came back. His tribe was all gone because of disease. And here they are struggling to make ends meet. And he shows up, an Indian, and speaks English to them. Now, you take, you take the miracle of that that he could have landed anywhere, they could have landed anywhere, but God providentially brought them and, and he taught them how to plant, he taught them what berries they could eat, he taught them how to survive, he taught them how to plant and raise corn. Think of this. What, what if? What if God had not brought Squanto? to them. You can only imagine, but we live off corn here in Iowa. When's the last time you thank God for bringing Squanto and the pilgrims together? I mean, this, this is stuff that, this is stuff you read about in the Bible. This is miraculous stuff. And, um, and yet in that that deadly winter, they were faced with many adversities, and yet because of God providentially bringing them, they were able to harvest their first crop. And that first crop rekindled in them the spirit of hope, and they set aside time to thank God and to build a lasting memorial for God's provisions. That God does bless those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. So, that's the history of that. But we celebrate the fourth Thursday of every November, Thanksgiving. On The November of 1863, if you know your history in 1863, you know what was going on. Our nation was in the midst of a civil war. President Abraham Lincoln proclaimed a national Thanksgiving Day to be held every November. In the midst of a civil war, not knowing whether the nation would even survive, in the midst of overwhelming sorrow and conflict and disaster, he proclaims a national day set aside for the giving of thanks. That's why we have this coming week, Thanksgiving Day. It's to remind us again of those that came, that they trusted God, 
that they persevered for the Lord, that they saw God intervene and provide for them, and that they gave thanks. But how did we get where we are today? Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, over a half a century ago, I was still a child, and I can remember hearing a number of old people offer the following explanations for the great disasters that had befallen Russia. Men have forgotten God. That's why all this has happened. He went on and said, Since then, I have spent well nigh 50 years working on the history of the Russian Revolution, and in the process I've read hundreds of books I have contributed eight volumes toward the history of it, but if I were asked today to formulate as concisely as possible, possible the main cause of the ruinous revelation that swallowed up some 60 million of our people, I could not put it more accu accurately than to repeat, men have forgotten God. That's why all this has happened. There's a reason God said to the children of Israel, remember, remember, remember. Because when we forget God, disasters come. Only by thanking God and doing so on a regular basis can the successful avoid the trap of worshiping themselves. Do you understand, do you understand this? When we become successful, if we don't have God first and foremost, we easily fall into the trap of worshiping ourselves. Look what I have done. Look what we have accomplished. And when you understand the hand of God in our nation, the hand of God in your life, it prevents that. Human beings find it very difficult to perpetually have gratitude. Unless people make a deliberate effort to be grateful, we quickly forget the good that other people have done to us, the good that we have experienced. Rather, remembering hurtful things comes far no, more naturally to us than remembering the good things that were done to us. Most of us can remember hurtful things that are done. We, we quickly forget the good things that people have done in our lives. And that's why God says it is imperative that you remember. We have forgotten, not remembered, we have forgotten God. We have forgotten where we came from, what God has done, and what made us great. So now bringing it down to our own personal lives. Every one of us as believers should be known as a thankful person. Turn with me to Colossians. And, and we could honestly spend all day supporting from Scripture this, that every Christian should be known as a thankful person. So let me ask, are you known as a thankful person? Do the people in your home know you as a thankful person? Do the people you work with know you as a thankful person? Colossians chapter 3, notice verse 10. Colossians chapter 3, let, let me begin reading just in verse 12, all right? Colossians chapter 3, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if any man has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, 
to which also ye are called in one body, and, notice this, be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. So he says, as a new man in Christ, one of the characteristics of our life should be that we have been delivered from the condemnation of, of hell and we have been made a new creation and we should be filled with overflowing to the power and the goodness of God to us, filled with thanksgiving. It is important that, that we understand that and realize if God did nothing else but deliver us from hell, that he would, he brought us to forgiveness, a child of God, we should be filled with thanksgiving. Colossians 2 and verse 7. As you have, verse 6, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. You are rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, and just overflowing. That's what it means, overflowing with thanksgiving. That whatever we do, Colossians 3.17, whatever you do, do it with thanksgiving. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 20. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. Giving thanks always... For all things to God and the Father. Similar to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 18. Giving thanks in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. As believers we should be known as thankful people. Charles Spurgeon said. Nothing has a greater effect on others than the consistent thankfulness of Christians. Crusty tempers and sour faces will never be good evangelists. To work to make others happy is one of the grand things a Christian should try to do. We should not be everlastingly worrying, fidgeting, finding difficulties, and spying out faults in others. To a faulty person, Everybody is faulty. When we are better, we realize others are better. When we are thankful, we will thank God that people are as good as they are. When you meet bad people, be thankful they are not worse than they are. Focus on the best points in them, not their worst. If you do, you will much more likely influence them for God. If, do, if you want to catch flies... Try honey. It is much more effective than vinegar. Let the general flow of your life be thankfulness to God, which helps you to love others. Let the general flow of your life be thankfulness to God. What would you say is the general flow of your thoughts? What is the general flow of your speech? Is it thankfulness to God? So we ask, what is it that hinders our gratitude? Number one, I would say, is pride. We think we deserve something or we think we accomplish something on our own. Henry Ward Beecher said, pride slays thanksgiving. But a humble mind is the soil out of which thanks naturally grows. A proud man is seldom a grateful man, for he never thinks he gets as much as he deserves. 
A proud man is an ungrateful man because he never thinks he gets as much as he deserves. And one of the things that just chops the legs out from a grateful spirit, a thankful spirit, is pride. Another thing is thoughtlessness. We don't think about what God has done. In Deuteronomy, he's saying, remember, remember, think about what I have done. And some of it was the blessings, some of it was the curse. But he said, remember what I have done. The origin of the word thankfulness comes from the similar word from where we get thankfulness. Because you can't give thanks unless you think. And it's, it's stopping and thinking about what God has done in our nation, in our personal lives, about who God is. But we don't think about that. And because we don't think, we don't give thanks. Another problem is comparison. We look at others. Well, they have that, and they have got this. And, and when we compare ourselves with one another, it makes thankfulness disappear in our lives. And all of these come from the fourth thing, we focus on self and not God. I mean, if we really thought about God and what he's done in our lives, our hearts and minds couldn't be filled with anything else but praise to him. I mean, honestly, we get comparing ourselves with others, we forget about God, and... and we focus on self and we're earthly minded. All we're thinking about is this life and this earth. Helen Keller, who when she was 19 months old, through adversity, lost her hearing and her sight, was mightily used of God was the first blind and deaf person to receive a bachelor's degree, um, appeared before presidents. But Helen Keller said, for three things I thank God every day of my life. I give thanks that he has given me the knowledge of his works. I give deep thanks that he has set in my darkness the lamp of faith. And I give deep, deepest thanks that I have another life to look forward to. A life joyous with light and flowers and heavenly song. Notice, she isn't just bound in thinking of herself. She isn't thinking of what she's accomplished. She's not comparing herself to one another. She's not just thinking in this earthly realm. She said, I give thanks that I can look forward to life. A life with joyous light. She's been in darkness all her life. A light full of flowers and heavenly songs. She hasn't been able to hear anything all her life. She's looking forward to that. And filled, she said, I thank God that he's given me knowledge of his works, faith in him, and the promised future that I have to look forward to. What hinders our gratitude, perhaps the most severe, is number six, we are lost in our sin. We are not a child of God. We have never experienced his grace in the forgiveness of our sins. We've never responded in humility to that. And so we are carrying the burden of sin in our life. We are weighed down by that burden of sin. And we don't have the greatest thing to give thanks for. Our salvation should be the foundation of everything that we give thanks for. 
And it's so easy for us, especially those of us that grew up in, in Christian homes, it's so easy for us to just take it for granted. Yeah, Jesus died for me. Yeah, yeah, I know that. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful. I mean, to get a grasp that we were condemned, separated from God for all eternity, and he was willing to forgive me. I mean, all these other things that I may think are not going right in my life, if nothing else, I have forgiveness of sins. It is well with my soul, and I will forever give thanks for that. As I, as I was thinking on these things today, this week, I, I was just convicted at my lack of thanksgiving. I was burdened for our nation. I, when I look at God's dealing with the children of Israel, I did this, I did this, I did this. And then he said, then you rebelled against me. And I thought, all the things God has done, just in, in, the, in those that came on the Mayflower, and how he preserved them, and how most of us will gather this Thursday, and it won't even, we, we've forgotten. The average person couldn't even tell you Three facts about the Mayflower. I challenge you, go interview people on the streets about our history, about Thanksgiving. But then I thought, and it, it burdened my heart, I thought, all that God has done to raise up this nation. And then in 1962, as a nation, we said, no, you can't have the Bible in school, and you can't have the prayer in school in 1963. And don't argue with me that, well, they still do. When a nation says that, how do you think God takes it? You have forgotten me. And when we have taken God's standards and God's principles regarding finances, regarding marriage, regarding the family, and we've said, get out of here. Do you think it bodes well for our nation? You know, one of the judgments that God says he'd bring over nations that turn away from him is he would bring an invasion of wicked people to rule over us. What do you think is happening in our nation? What do you think is happening in any nation that doesn't have borders, which we don't have? This is a fulfillment. It's not God's judgment is going to come on America. God's judgment is on America because we have forgotten God. Now, what can I do about all that? I can do one thing, I can make sure I don't forget about God, and I can make sure that I live a life of thanksgiving, and I can make sure that, that I pass on the message of God's intervention in our life. We could go on and on throughout all of history, all of our history, and tell incredible stories of George Washington having bullet holes in his coat but none of them reached him, and he survived. Incredible. How do you explain that? That's God. And we could go on and list many other things, but sad to say, in many of we as Christians' homes, we have forgotten God. We don't talk about the things of God. And in Deuteronomy, over and over, and we went through that over and over again. Remember, remember, in, in your lives, God has done amazing things that you have, you have forgotten about. Your kids don't know anything about it. Your grandkids don't know anything about it. Why are we saying we've forgotten God? Because... 
we are commanded to talk of the mighty works of God. And this is, this is very convicting to me. It's easy, as we said, it's easy to see what's wrong. It's easy to gripe. That comes naturally. You don't have to work on complaining. You have to work on remembering and giving thanks. And as believers, if nothing else, and I don't say that to minimize, but he saved us. I mean, he gives us a promise of an eternity with him. Our sins are forgiven. Don't lose sight of that. And that ought to motivate us to, to say that because he has delivered me, I will give thanks. Ray Comfort said, the key to passion and zeal is gratitude. And gratitude comes by just backing up a little and realizing how much you have sinned against God and he has forgiven you. To back up. Sad to say, many of us think, well, yeah, I'm a sinner, but I'm not as bad as... But our gratefulness to whom much is forgiven, they love much. They're grateful for much. And I, I believe today that we need to be called to repent of an ungrateful spirit. As believers, I need to repent of an ungrateful spirit and then to say, God, help me to focus on you so that out of me flows a spirit of thankfulness. Heavenly Father, I pray today that we would be reminded of the great works that you have done not only in our nation and in our world, but, Lord, in our individual lives. I pray that we would have a renewed appreciation for your salvation, your personal forgiveness. And, Lord, I pray that we would guard our thoughts and any thought of negativity and complaining and griping would be put down, and that we would be abounding with thanksgiving. Lord, even this week, as we celebrate your hand of mercy and protection and provision on our land, may it motivate us to daily, around the clock and throughout the year, to be filled with thanksgiving. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.